Hallelujah. Let's go to John 6, 1 through 14. The Gospel of John, chapter 6. It's good to have babies in the house of the Lord. It's like you're fighting to get a clean car when you have kids, and then they move out and move on, and you'd do anything to have a dirty car again as long as they were there. It's like that. I, I wouldn't want to go without having a baby interrupt every single service because that is joyous to me. Are you in John 6? Are you there? After, let's read it, the first verse. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did. You know, some will follow for the miracles. Some will follow because they love Jesus. I didn't mean to drop a bomb there, but you know what I mean. On them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat, and his disciples in the Passover, the and the Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh or near. And when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw the great multitude or great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall ye buy bread that these may eat? And he said to prove him, he said this to Philip to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, 200 penny worth of bread. It's, there's not enough here. It's not sufficient. There's no way we could buy food for all these people. Jump down to verse 9. There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves or five bread loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? So the disciple, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, found a boy, a lad with a lunch, but even he did not believe that it was enough. He's like, what is this among all these people? And Jesus said, have him sit down and watch what happens. When you bring little to the master's hands, he multiplies it and he puts it out. And what you see God do through that is miraculous. And so he made, in verse 10, Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Oftentimes, we think that God will just do miracles, but sometimes he's waiting for us to get structure in our life to show his miracles. Oops. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. Notice, Jesus didn't hand them to the multitude. He gave them to his disciples, and his disciples multiplied it to the, to the people. And the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise the fishes, as much as they would. And they were filled. Everybody say filled. filled. He said unto the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Amen. Nothing is going to be lost when God's done with his miracle in your life. Jesus, thank you for your word. We ask you to bless it. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. I have always known that there is a caution to pursuing miracles over the master. There is a danger to getting his acts, the miraculous acts of God in your life without asking him, can I know your ways? It is always important for us to know that we don't have enough to give. We need Jesus to touch what we have. Amen? Yes. So throughout time, you see in the scriptures the willingness to offer what people had to God, even though it was never going to to be enough. And this little boy finds two fish and five loaves to be something that he can give to the master. Now, I don't know if you would process this with me the same way, but I wonder if the boy looked around. I think he was old enough to see his lunch wasn't big enough for the crowd. I think his disciples obviously showed that they knew his lunch wasn't big enough for the crowd. But when Jesus gets whatever we offer, I want to tell you today, you've got to give what you got. Amen? You just, you just got to give what you got. And, and you're going to need to have something to give. And sometimes when we get to the end, you're going to realize that I'm, I'm headed in a direction that I want to encourage somebody to give their heart to the Lord. But 
in the times that we're living in, there's, there's a blessing in surrender. There's a blessing in giving. Even in hard times, even in economic distress, when you give to the Lord, there's a multiplication through God's power. Amen? There's something that happens, and we know that God moves because focus is always what he looks for. And when we focus on him and just give what we got, no, it may not match the need. It never was going to match the need in John 6 until God got his hands on it. And then the need maker, the way maker, the miracle worker, all of a sudden was able to match the need in the room. So don't ever worry about how great your need is. Just give what you've got to God of your time and your talent and your offerings and whatever you have to give. So when it feels like you can't sow and God will impact an entire generation from your gift of generosity, God can change something miraculous. The boy's small little lunch fed the multitude and he had a story to tell for the rest of his life. Would you like to have a story to tell for the rest of your life about how you gave a little and God took it and made it so much more than you could ever have made it. Look for opportunities in your life to give, even if it feels like it's not enough, give anyways. Even if it feels like you're out of energy, put them to bed and kiss them on the head and read them a story and start over tomorrow and and love them again and work with them again and help them with that, that temperament again and work on your children and your family and love them again and work through things that are always difficult, but you know, even when you don't feel like you have enough to hold that relationship together, give that relationship to Jesus, put it in his hands and he'll miraculously multiply the the glue of that moment and and keep you held together. Amen? God can work great things in our life. But there is something known as the spiritual heart condition. And I have notes everywhere today, so I'm just going to lay them out here. It's the paradox of preaching. Sometimes it comes together really good and other times you're seeking after the Spirit of God. But sometimes our heart can stay stubborn. Hello, somebody. Sometimes our heart likes to be that sheep that runs off from the 99. We have an internal condition of a rebellious heart. Scripture speaks about it a lot, all the way from Deuteronomy to the end of the the books. And, And in that particular place in Scripture's, we know that our heart can be rebellious, and our heart must be transformed. Amen? So in Scripture, we find that God is focusing us in a way to give something that we can give. And we know that our heart is something that is never going to be enough to love God the way we want to love God. And our heart will never be enough to stay the way we should stay. And and somehow we don't manage to be as faithful sometimes as we need to be faithful. But I'm, I'm turning this service over to Jesus and just asking the Lord to help some of us that may be struggling with a rebellious heart, that if you will just take that to Jesus as well. I know we talk about the miracles and the beautiful things and the gifts that we can give and the prayers we can pray and the, and the anointing and the intercession that we can give for others. But I'm wondering if you know today that even if you are the stray, even if you're the black sheep in your family and you're watching online, if you give your rebel heart to Jesus, he'll take your stony heart out and he'll put in a new heart and he'll fill you with his spirit and you will find miracle manifestation in your life. You will go into multiplication. You will see God's helping you and using you and the multiplication of his power will show up in your life and you will impact with generosity other generations, whether it's giving of your time or your talent or just the seeds of word sown of affirmation in somebody's life. God will use you to multiply something that's far more reaching than you could ever understand. The challenge, the challenge is, can you give him your heart? See, you have to learn how to give him your heart because if you don't, God can do all kinds of miracles for you and you will still walk away someday. I've watched it happen as a youth pastor for over 10 years. I watched as young people would come to the Lord, give their life to God, and walk with him for a while. But it was always a transactional relationship. I'll do this for you if you do that for me. 
I'll give this if you'll give back to me. I'll tithe if you'll pay my bills. I'll help if you do this. I'll, I'll stand in and be a volunteer as long as I don't have to do it every week. And I'm not saying anything against all of those things, but I did watch a pattern start to develop, and it was that people weren't giving their hearts to God. They were looking for God to bless them more than they were willing to give themselves up to him. And the danger in that is seeing God's miracles happen and never have your heart turned over to the Lord. Young man, I'll change his name to Michael. He was in our youth group, and Michael was gifted. He was a young man, but he had a problem. He had a major scar on the side of his body where he'd had a massive surgery as a young child. He was born with one lung and just a stump on the other side. All it was, it just kind of looked like a deformed fist on the right side of his body. So they went in and they closed it up, and he has breathed his entire life. He's now in the youth group, and he breathed his entire life with that one left lung. And he'd grown that lung, of course. The body responds beautiful how fearfully and wonderfully made we are because his lung had grown so large to compensate for the loss of the other lung. But he came down and they prayed over him. And he said, you know what, I'm having some struggles breathing. And it was something that was new to him. It was something that was coming up. He, they had prayed for him when he was a baby. They thought, okay, God gave him a strong lung. He, God can do with one what we can do with two. That's what they believed. And so they just trusted the Lord. But then he started having some complications. And he came to the pastors and they anointed him with oil. And they said, you know what, we're just going to believe for a miracle. He was going to go in and get some testing done, find out if maybe that one side, that stump of a lung had got infected somehow because it didn't function right anyways. And we began to pray for him. And I tell you what, I, I don't know anything other in that moment than feeling like there wasn't enough in the situation. He was having struggle breathing, and we felt anointed with oil, Pray the prayer of faith. Believe God. We knew what the word of God said. But I didn't know if it was going to make any difference at the moment. I wanted to believe. And I'm a man of faith. I believe God could do anything. And so we gathered around and prayed. And I felt the heavens opened up. And I felt this tingling presence roll down us. And I just I knew that God was in the room. And I didn't know what he was doing. But I knew God was doing something. I was believing for the good lung to get better. And he went in and got x-rays. And when they brought him out of the x-ray room, they, they brought the parents and they said, I don't know if we know how to really scientifically or medically explain what we're about to tell you. But your son has lived with no lung on the right side of his body. And somehow when we did all of the investigation and did all of the testing and did all of the scans and did all of the x-rays, we don't know how it got there, but he has a matching lung on the right side of his body where there used to be only a stump. When it feels like you don't have enough, anoint with oil anyways. Pray the prayer of faith anyways. And God can do a miracle. And God did something great for him. And I wish I could tell you that that is the miracle that he lived with for the rest of his life. But today, Michael does not walk with God. God gave him, and I know that's, that sucks all the energy out of the room. I get that. But I want you to understand that when you walk with God only for the miracles and you don't ask him to get into your heart and start touching your heart and changing the way you see things and the way you believe things and the way you act and, and the way that you deal with that rebel heart in you, you don't see God the way he wants you to see him. Proverbs 14 and 12, it says, there appears a way that's right to man, but the end leads to death. And we know that all have fallen short of the glory of God. We know that in Scripture. And I skipped a couple of them. I'm sorry, media. I missed it on the, on the page. I jumped a page. But Ezekiel tells us, let's go back if you wouldn't mind, media team. Ezekiel 36 and 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will remove from you a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Yeah. I understand that there is a rebel heart in us, but if you let the Spirit of God work, you can get a singleness of heart, the Scripture says, where you walk with God and you're pleased and you're also satisfied with the things that God brings in your life. 
Acts, Acts tells us that in Acts chapter 3, 41 through 47. This is the people of God. They've all gathered together. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized. Notice that people that received preaching got baptized immediately. Notice that. So there's people that received the word, and when they gladly received it, they got baptized. And the same day, they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then it says this about the beauty of fellowship and unity. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread. Is it up there? I'll read it for you. In breaking of bread in prayer, and in prayer. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. There was miracles. There was fear of God in the room, and they believed, and they were together, and all had things in common, and some sold to help others and give blessings. And then you get down to verse 46. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread house to house. They didn't just go to church, but they met in life group. Amen, somebody. And did eat their meat with gladness and singleness. Everybody look there. And singleness of heart. Oh, I, that's okay. It's a holiday. I don't know what's going on with the screens. It's a holiday weekend. Come back when everybody's here. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Notice that God can take a rebel heart and he can make it into a heart that's focused with singleness for God. And when God does that, that builds a room full of people that know how to focus and be in unity. And God saves who he will want to save. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And so we have to understand that you, you have to be careful not to trust your heart. You have to trust God's word. And there's going to be moments where you have to lean on God outside of your own understanding that he's going to do something and he's going to work for you beyond your ability to understand what he's doing. In Proverbs 28, 14, there is something very powerful. It's a promise from God, and it's, it's in this scripture. It says, blessed is the one who also trembles before God, who has a hey, healthy fear of the awesomeness of God. But who, whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. Do you see that? Falls into mischief. This is a warning from the word of God. The, the wisest man, Solomon, was known to have right Proverbs. He said, happy is the man that fears God. There's a blessing in trembling before God and keeping God in front of you as your Lord and your Savior. And I will obey his word and I will do what he says. But whoever hardens their heart says, nah, I'm going to live my own life. I'm going to go my own way. You fall into trouble, he says. You're going to find mischief in life. And so I'm thankful that all have sinned. And we understand that all have been recovered and can be recovered by Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that I know that I'm not just an island where my heart wants to run off sometimes and God has to come and get me. I'm grateful that I'm not a person that knows that I can be overcome with shame because of the things that I feel like God is speaking to me and I don't know if I can live up to those things and God is leading me to places where I don't feel like I have all the qualifications. Have you ever been there before where you feel like it's just a little too too much for me. Maybe it's just I'm called to something that's a little bit bigger than me. Well, I want to tell you that if you give your heart to the Lord, he will help you by the power of his spirit to accomplish everything he set in front of you. He didn't want you to do it by yourself. He didn't want you to do it without his help. He planned on putting you in impossible situations because when he steps in with you, impossible leaves the room. Amen? Because when God shows up, impossible does not exist anymore. God can do miracle working power, and God calls us just to surrender your heart. I know you're like, but, man, but pastor, you don't know what I've, where I've been. You don't know where my rebel heart has run me off to. Give it to God anyways. And if you give it to God, guess what it does? It doesn't make you just a person coming for the miracles that Jesus does. and now makes you a person longing for relationship with Almighty God, and you can ask heaven 
Lord, show me your ways. He will not show his ways to a people that haven't surrendered their rebel hearts to him. But when you give your heart, that thing that wants to be deceitful, when you give your heart to Jesus, he starts to change your desires and he starts to work on you and he starts to move in your life and pretty soon all of a sudden you start to see his ways in the word of God and you want to live differently. There is a way that appears right unto a man but the end thereof is death. Consequences of a rebel heart that aren't submitted to God is you run after things that lead to destruction. Romans 1, 21 and 22, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, for their foolish hearts were darkened. Notice, it's a heart matter. I mean, people try to put stuff on devices, people try to do blocking, people try to control things, and it's never been the device. We went from online to in our pocket. We went from places where it was difficult to access to now having seconds to access all kinds of sin in our world. And the only thing that's different is if you've dealt with this thing. It's not a matter of the device. It's a matter of the heart. And that's why we have to talk about the heart. Have you surrendered your heart to him? Joel gives us a beautiful picture of this. Joel 2, 12 through 13. Look at the word of God. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your what? All your heart. And with fastings and with weeping and with mourning. Oh, that sounds like a joy ride. <laughs> Woohoo! That's one of the rides at Disney World. You get on it, and it says, fasting, weeping, and mourning shall happen on this ride. And everybody lines up. Good times. <laughs> that is not something that people want. But you don't understand. If you have had a heart that has run off so far that now you're living in consequences so deep that when you find this scripture, you're like, it's going to take some fasting to get my heart turned around. It's going to take some weeping for me to get back in relationship with him. It's going to take some loss for me to get back where I wanted to be with God. And when you realize that and you're willing to cut every tie and move away from everything that keeps you from Jesus, something turns around in your heart. And it says, return to me with your heart, with fasting, weeping, mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. And then look what Matthew says. 22 and 37, love the Lord your God with all your what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Heart is included in everything we do, and I'm asking you just to give your heart to Jesus today. That is a very big ask, but it's worthy of a sermon, amen? It's worthy of an entire service. It's worthy of us saying, I'll give what I got. I've got this heart that likes to do some things, and, and every once in a while it doesn't want to do the things of God. Paul said, even when I wanted to do good, I didn't do it. And even when I wanted to give or do things right, I ended up falling short. Even Paul had a heart that didn't do everything right. So don't think you're just an island unto yourself. We're not. God knows what we can give and what we can't, but his spirit empowers us. He will create a pure heart in us. He will renew a steadfast spirit within us. Praise the Lord. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Thank God for the word of God that transforms our heart. And we can say, just like David, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not conform. I won't, I won't, Lord. I don't want to. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, living a submitted heart life, says that you have done everything you can to give your heart to Jesus. And you have to do it again, and you have to do it again. The Bible calls us a living sacrifice. You know what the problem is with a living sacrifice in Romans? We like to get off the altar. <laughs> we like to climb off the place of sacrifice. We don't want to be there. It's uncomfortable. So we have to get up every day, I say this a lot, put two feet on the floor, and before you even put your socks on, you have to give your heart back to the Lord. Before your coffee and before your grumpy goes away, <laughs> before
before you get to that point in the coffee cup where it says, okay, now you can talk, you know, you've seen those, you need to give your heart to Jesus because he will shelter you and he will keep you. He'll cover you and conform you to his pattern that he wants for your life. Would you just say amen for a minute? Thank you, Jesus. Galatians 5 and 16 and 17 says, so I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. If you walk in the Spirit. Now some actually take that literally and they go for a walk every morning. My pastor used to do that. Pastor Kylie, he'll be here November 10th when we do our Legacy Sunday. He's preaching for us November 10th. And he gets up every morning. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm so excited. He gets up every morning and he puts his jacket on and gets out the door in seconds. I don't know about you, but that would be too much of a shock for me. I mean, come out, mess up man, freedom. <laughs> that's just, I don't know, that's, that's a recipe for a heart attack to me. I mean, it's like he gets a miracle every winter morning when he goes for a walk. It's like, get up, dirty hair, get outside, heart attack. Jesus raises him. <laughs> that's his life. He's seen many miracles. <laughs> But he does that. He takes it literally. He goes for a walk every morning and he talks with God. There's a place in Scripture that talks about Moses being a friend of God and he talks to him like he would a friend face to face. What would it be like to be in God's presence and to have our heart so surrendered to God that he speaks to us like a friend? Amen, somebody. Therefore, if any is in Christ, he's a new creation. Trust, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your what? Heart. And lean not to your own understanding. In all your, it's so easy to lean on our own understanding. Would somebody preach with me in the room? It is so easy to run off to what we know we need to do. Some of you have years of education in a university to know what you need to do. Amen? I'm not against that. But sometimes we have to lay it all down and say, Jesus, what do I do? What's my next step? Guide my feet. Lead me in the paths of righteousness. Help me. Submit all of your ways to him, and he will make your path straight. Everybody say ways. It is very powerful what happens in the scriptures when you see people coming out of Egypt with Moses. They have lived there for 400 plus years. They're headed out of Egypt, and Moses is leading this band of misfits. You know the story. There's... Ten plagues that hit Egypt just to get them out. All they want to do is go out and worship. Egypt turns around and realizes, I just lost my workforce. So Pharaoh says, go get them. The Lord parts the Red Sea. They go through on dry land. God closes the sea on the army of the Egyptians. And then tambourines break out on the bank. Don't bring a tambourine to church. You will mess us up on this platform. Because we got clicks going in our ears. We don't need a tambourine off. We don't need some rogue tambourine, all right? Uh, we'll, we'll create a tambourine place for you to worship in the side room, and we'll pipe in the church service for you. And you, just, you just go nuts. I'm kidding. I, I'm a little bit off. Let me get back to my notes. They had water turned to blood. They had frogs. They had lice. They had wild animals. They had flies, pestilence. They had boils. Thunderstorms and hail, locusts, darkness for three days. All of this to get them out of Egypt. You think that would have made them surrender their heart to God. And then they walk for 40 years. Look at this verse in Psalms 103. David finds, in 103 verse 7, he finds something so beautiful. See, the difference between the people of God was they experienced the acts of God, but they didn't ask for the ways of God. So whenever you get to Psalms 103, verse 7, David is like, here's the secret. If you put it up there, I appreciate it. He says, he made known his ways unto Moses. Psalms 103, verse 7. You guys can pull it up. His acts unto the children of Israel. Here's the proof. I'll read it to you again. He made, way, he made known his ways. Everybody say ways. ways. Unto Moses. His acts unto the children of Israel. Notice the difference. Moses wanted to see and know God's ways. Hebrews will tell you that. He said, show me thy ways, O God. His desire was to see the ways of the Lord, not just the actions of God, not just the miracles of God. 
But the children of Israel, they ran around for 40 years in a wilderness, and their hearts still were not submitted to God. How would you like it if you woke up every morning and God made you breakfast? Manna on the ground, breakfast for you every morning. You come out your tent, hey, manna bagels, <laughs> manna waffles, manna cotti. <laughs> <laughs> the audience response of the year. I think, I think we're going to put that in the book for 2024, manna cotti. Banana bread. Okay, that one's not as manic. That's not as good as manicotti. God makes you breakfast every morning. He provides for your needs, and your heart is still far from God, and you're like, would to God we died in Egypt? Because they only experienced the acts of God and never, like Moses, got to the point of asking, show me your ways, O oh God. And so you cannot ask God, show me your ways, until you've submitted your rebel heart. That is the point that I'm trying to make today. You can give God everything you have, whether it's great or little, but if you never give him your heart, he will never show you the beauty of his ways. You will see the miracles of God, and your heart will still want to run off. Is that too heavy today? I hope this helps you. So God showed Moses that he could provide, but Moses wasn't in it for the miracles. The miracles were needed for the people. They needed water. They needed food. But 2 Corinthians tells me that there was a rock in the wilderness, and when they got thirsty, the Bible says that the Lord God told Ab or Moses to speak to or smote the rock first. And can you imagine having all these disgruntled people, and God said, hit the rock, and he's like, yeah, I'll do that. So the first time he hits the rock. And then the next time, God said, okay, now we're going to go to another level. I want you to obey my word. And that is what God had given him. God had given him the law. He was living under the law. You obey the word of God in the Old Testament. So whenever you break the word of God by disobedience, there were great consequences in the Old Testament. And so the next time, he's angry at the people and they need water. And 2 Corinthians says, that rock followed them in the wilderness. I don't know about you, but I've never been in my garden and walked around and found a rock following me. There's, there's no rocks moving in my place. I don't know if you got miracles happening over in your garden. But somehow, whenever God chooses to provide for his people, he always does it when they, first when they immediately turn to him. That is a miracle understanding of revelation, that when your heart, your rebel heart has not been submitted to God, and it runs you off into some things that you know you should not be in, when you take a moment and you go, I don't belong here, I don't need these consequences, I'm a child of God, and you turn back because you're in a wilderness place, and your soul has gotten so thirsty for God, the moment you turn, there's that rock, there's that nourishment, there's that water to nourish your soul. Jesus will go with you, but when you turn back, he's right there to, miracle, to bring miracles into your life. That is beautiful for me to know. So he's providing for the people through Moses, but Moses just wants to be with him. God takes him up on the mountain. We know that the mountain still has scars to this day. They believe that Mount Sinai at the top of it, he, he hides Moses in a rock in a cleft, and he shows him all these things in Exodus 19 on through, how to build the tabernacle. All of these things are happening, and God is giving him a full download all the way to, ver to chapter 33 of Exodus. And now we see that Jesus is, is or that God is working with, with Moses, and, and he got promises in the land, and, he, and he's got a, a, a mission to take the people into the promised land, but here comes the anger, and here comes the frustration. Never let the pressure of the people make you do something that God has not instructed you to do, because that is what Moses did. Don't ever let the pressure of people that you're leading in your job or in your places of work make you do something that you're not instructed to do. Hello, somebody? I won't say it a third time, but I definitely know this, that there is some pressure that will make you try to do some things, and so 
Moses is up on the mountain with God, and, and God is speaking to him, and God says, okay, pause. I need you to go down and take care of the situation in the valley. They've built a golden calf, and they're all worshiping around this golden calf, and I need you to go deal with the people. And Moses brings down the, the fing, fiery finger uh, law of God, and he sees these people worshiping before a calf because Moses has left them, and the pressure of the people came on Aaron, and it said, give us a God. Give us a God to worship. They were people that came out of Egypt, and they were expecting to still worship a physical God when God wanted to be their spiritual God. And so God had to teach them. But in the process, things happen, and he gets upset, and then there's frustrations, and there's dealing with Korah and all of the individuals that Moses has to deal with. And now we get to the point where the people are thirsty again, and now God says, speak to the rock, and I'll bring forth water. And Moses says, I feel like hitting this rock because I'm frustrated with these people. It's either beat the rock or beat them. <laughs> so he hits the rock again and God says, oh, you've broken my word of obedience. I, I asked you to speak to the rock. You've let your anger lead you to a place. You've let your rebel heart run off. And instead of staying in my word, now there's going to be consequences. And so we see that God brings him up to Nebo in numbers, and he says, you see out there, that's the promised land, but you're never going there. You're going to stay on this side, and they're, the people of God are going to go on in with Joshua. Do you want to serve a God like that? Because people at that point are like, that's harsh. That's like another level of harsh. He lives for God. He ends up in Midian as a shepherd. He comes out, burning bush, all of this stuff, take your shoes off kind of stuff because God doesn't want anything man-made between him and Moses. So he goes through all of this. He leads the people out. And now because he smites a rock instead of speak to it, you're disqualified for the promised land? It seems harsh unless you know that God was Moses' friend. And God said, I can't let you break my law and get into the promised land because that breaks, that breaks the symbolism all the way through the New Testament of my word being what you obey to get to promise. And so what he does, he says, hold on. Let's go up Mount Nebo the Holy Ghost right now, and I'm going to show you the promised land so that whenever you show up there one day, you're going to know that you made it, but you're only going to make it because I'm going to provide a way for you to get there. So his rebel heart, God provided for him because we get into Matthew. Help me out, team. We get into Matthew. 17, verse 1 through 3. I, I wanted to read Hebrews 3, but you can read it on your own for homework. But we get into Matthew, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his, his best friends, okay, his brother, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mount. This is the Mount of Transfiguration. And go into the next verse. And was transfigured before them. Jesus goes glow in the dark. His body is transformed. And his face shines like the sun, and his raiment as white as the light. And look what happens. And behold, there appears unto them, who? God was saying when he took him up to Nebo as his friend, I can't let you break my word and go into the promised land, but just hold on a minute, and I'll let you see where you're going to stand someday, and I'm going to bring you back, and you're going to stand next to me, and you'll get everything you were meant to get because God will give you your promised land, but you're going to have to go through Jesus to get there. I love that word. Put it back up, would you, please? Moses said, on, this helps me. I don't know if this helps you, but this helps me because I got a rebel heart that wants to run off all the time. Thank God for his grace. I'm not meaning gross sin. Just everybody, don't write me. I'm talking about just moments of grumpiness, okay? On one side, 
He's got Elisha. The man that went up in a whirlwind of fire. The man that experienced all of these great things of God. And on the other side, he's got Moses who is full of mistakes, full of trouble, full of trauma. Can't even speak well because he's overwhelmed all the time by the people and by his life. And now he's here and he's standing with Jesus at the moment of transfiguration. If that's not a hopeful story for you, it's a hopeful story for me. Because that means no matter how much I try and fail, if I just keep giving this rebel heart back to God, if I keep on saying, Lord, if I messed up, I'm going to come through with you every time. I'm going to come through Jesus every time and coming through him means that I'm going to make it. He leads me into the place of promise through Jesus Christ. Somebody said amen. amen. I'm so thankful that I can walk with him and that I can talk with him. And he tells me that I'm his own. Would you stand with me today? Jesus said I'm the way, the truth, and the life. When you go to Jesus, you're going to the right place. Romans 9, 10, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save them through him. Moses had to come through Jesus. And we have to as well. Yeah. Amen. The Bible says in Acts, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There is something new that can be birthed in you, and your rebel heart can turn into a heart that's after God, yeah. that literally desires God. For it is by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that you that no one can boast. You can't say, I conquered this rebel heart. You can only surrender it to God. And I'm telling somebody in this room, give him what you've got. I don't care how much you've run off or run away or I don't care who's in this room and they're in a pig pen as a prodigal right now. I'm telling you, give God what you've got. I know it's a rebel heart sometimes, but give him that. He wants that. He'll turn it around. He'll help you and he'll touch you because he is the way. He is the gateway to your salvation. He was the gateway for Moses. He didn't put Moses on Nebo and then just bury him without promise. You're not going to be buried in your situation and your struggle if you give your heart to the Lord. Whatever enters into your life, God can save you out of. I'm thankful that I know that he justified me through faith. And we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Every consequence fell on him at that cross, and we come under his blood so that we're safe and we feel free to release the little thing we have. It seems so little, but has such great consequence. Maybe there's someone in this room today that you've seen God do many works in your life, but for some reason your heart keeps running off. If you submit your rebel heart, God will show you his ways like you have never, like you have never seen him work in your life. I wonder if there's somebody willing today to say, yeah, you're, no consequences. No one's going to come and, and lay their shoulder, hand on your shoulder and, and shake you and pray for you. That's not going to happen. But if there's somebody in this room that wants an altar today and said, if Moses had to go through Jesus, then I better go through Jesus. If Moses had a moment with anger that kept him out of the promise, then I don't want my temper to keep me out of the promise. I don't want my situation. I don't want this struggle. This altar is open for you. Praise be to God and our Father. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, for his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Come on, give your rebel heart to Jesus. I don't know where you've been. I don't know if you struggled this week. I don't know if you need just a little more help with your surrender. If you're surrendering your heart regularly, but you just struggle with it, why don't you pray right now? I want to encourage the believers to assure, assure you that God will meet you here right now. This altar is open. There's someone that needs to lay down anything 
that is trying to drag you away from Jesus. It's a small thing. It seems like such a small thing, but would you step out of your pew? Would you come stand around this altar? Little is much when God's in it. Come on. Somebody, come on. Just come stand. You don't have to kneel. Just come and stand. And say, Jesus, I give you my heart today. My hallelujah belongs to Jesus, I give you my heart today. Jesus, I give you my heart today. Transform us, God, as we submit to you. We're going to give you what we've got. We give you our hearts today, God. Thank you, Jesus, for making a way. My hallelujah belongs to you. Why don't you give him a praise from the bottom of your heart? Just say, Jesus, my heart belongs to you. I know I'm that sheep that runs off. I know I'm that one that has that heart that always wants to do it my way, but God, I'm surrendering to you today. I don't want to just see your acts. I, I, I know your miracles are an invitation, not the destination, God, but I, I, I don't want you to see your miracles. I want to see your ways in my life. Show me your ways, oh God. Like Moses prayed, show me. I surrender my rebel heart because I want to see you work your ways in my life. Help us, Jesus, today to lay down anything that drives us out of your presence. Help us lay down anything that speaks to us louder than your voice, Jesus. Little is much when God's in it. Come on, somebody, give what you've got today. Give what you've got today. Others may not want what you have to give, but Jesus wants it. Others may say, no, that's not a good enough gift, but Jesus said, that's what I died for. I died for your heart. I died so that you could come and give yourself. My hallelujah belongs to you. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is merciful. Come on, receive his multiplied mercies today. Receive his multiplied mercies in your life. You deserve it, Lord Jesus. I give what I've got. I give you my heart. It's a gift worth giving because you purchased it on your cross. You deserve it, Lord God. You gave so much so that I have this opportunity in this room right now. Come on, somebody lift your hands and just worship him for a minute. You deserve it. You deserve all of me, Jesus. You deserve You deserve all of me, Jesus. You deserve I bless your name, Lord. I bless your name, Lord. You deserve I come through that man, Christ Jesus. All of the glory belongs to you. Hallelujah, Jesus. All of the glory belongs to you. All of the glory belongs to you. All of the glory belongs to you. You deserve it. Sounds so beautiful. Sing it out today. Everybody's the choir. You deserve it. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody together. Sing it out. You deserve it, God. You deserve all of me. You 